and everyone, you've focused on book value per share growth over a five-year period. You know, historically, uh, your compensation is is uh, set by that and total shareholder return, which I applaud, by the way. Um, but Tom, you've said publicly, and I believe written, that due to the acquisitions and changes over the years, that book value has become less of a meaningful measure. So could you uh, talk to us about how you think about valuing Markel today? I mean, I, I see the insurance business, the Markel Ventures business, and then the two interesting things you're doing in insurance, which you call other, um, and talk about you know, how should we think about the value of Markel? I'm gonna sit down to write down the answer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's an important topic. It's something that has been talked about in our own boardroom, and you know, Richie and Jeremy and I have all talked about this over the, the last several years. So a couple of things. One, I was very grateful this year and thankful when I received the Berkshire annual report, and he started off with why book value does not uh, comprehensively describe the progress at Berkshire these days. I've been saying that for a couple of years now, so it's nice to have my big brother Warren say it as well, because there's amazingly enough, there's a lot of people in life who pay more attention to what he says than what I say. <laughs> so I'm very grateful that he said that. And, and I think his, his explanation and analysis for that is, is exactly right. Um, within the context of the Markel annual report, if you read the shareholder's letter, uh, I'm pretty sure, I, I, I was the guy who wrote it, so I should know this for a fact, and I'm gonna guess, and I'm sure I'll be fact-checked and proven wrong, but I don't think in the body of the letter I talked about book value at all. I talked about a lot of financial metrics, but I did not use that. So that omission in and of itself is, you know, like the Sherlock Holmes dog that did not bark. So for finan financial businesses, and our insurance business is a financial business, and book value does do a good job of describing the classic insurance component of our business. But the, the change in Markel over the last uh, 10 years and last five years uh, at an accelerating pace is we have businesses other than insurance uh, within our operation. Now, as an example, I think uh, Taylor had mentioned we, we shifted from the, the Hilton to the Marriott and he, and he tipped the hat that you know we're Marriott shareholders we have been for a long time. Well, he's exactly right. And, and if you look at the Marriott Corporation financial statement, what you'll see and I, I, I don't know this for a fact in my head right now. I know it was true before the Starwood deal, and you know that introduces some accounting uh, machinations, but I'm, I'm highly confident this was a true statement before the Starwood deal, and it will be increasingly true as time goes by for Marriott. The book value of Marriott is negative, and it's been declining. Well, well good gracious, if you looked at a financial business and you saw the book value go down and you saw it go into negative territory and get more negative, the conclusion you would draw is they're broke. But they're not. They're doing great. And it's because that's a business that doesn't require much capital. And the way you should think about valuing Marriott is you should think about the cash flow being produced. And it does not require much capital to produce the cash flow they have. This facility that we have uh, is probably owned, probably owned by somebody other than Marriott. What Marriott has is the management contract, the reservation system, which requires very little capital. And what Marriott does with the cash that they generate, because they don't have to reinvest it in physical, tangible facilities, is they buy back stock. And when you buy back stock at a price that is higher than what your stated gap book value is, that makes the gap uh, book value go down every single time you do that. You know, and we're at the stage at Markel where we have a number of non-financial businesses, which to some degree are like what Marriott is. So it's an income statement business, something that produces cash flow and doesn't require much capital. And the way I would value that is I would um, make an estimate of what the cash flows are going to be, and I would apply a market multiple to it. And so I think that the stock market in the long run is pretty efficient and it, it gets that, and over the last several years, the divergence between the market price of Markel and the, and the book value has widened, 
I would suspect that would continue to be the case. And insurance links to securities is somewhat of a hybrid because it has the word insurance in it, but the valuation mechanism is really more like the way you would think about our ventures business, i.e. a multiple of, of the cash flow. Now to recognize that uh, and make sure that we are aligned as managers of the business that you owned, we did make a change in our incentive compensation system this past year where uh, the first step was Richie and I, half of our compensation is now no longer based on just the five-year uh, compound growth and book value, but also the five-year total shareholder return. So what you make as a shareholder, point to point over five years by owning the stock, is half of our compensation. And Jeremy joined the party in that, so you know, you know we're, we're a crawl, walk, run company in many ways. This was a this was a heavy duty boardroom discussion of, of making this particular yes. change. So at first they, they made it for Richie and me. We included uh, Jeremy, and, and I think it'll spread to people in the organization who are tied to things other than the insurance business. It, it would make sense to have a different mechanism than just book value. And then the last thing I'll say about this before uh, offering the mic is a uh, so. Well, how about this? And, and this speaks to the muddiness and the fact that you need to make judgments about things. So think about progressive, you know, which Buffett and Munger talked a lot about in the meeting yesterday. Progressive is an insurance company in every form and facet and way that you could possibly think about it. But progressive has sold at a high multiple to its book value forever, for, for a long time. Well, why is that? Well, the old joke about progressive is that it's a Mensa club masquerading as an insurance company. They're really smart. I mean, what they do is, is really worthy of study. They're very good at what they do. And as a consequence, really what you get when you're buying Progressive is not a commodity insurance company that would be well described and valued by, by the book value. You're, you're, what you're buying into is the intellectual capacity of the management of that business, which produces higher and higher cash flows as, as time goes by. So it's just a different way of thinking about it, and that, that is the way I think about Markel, is I break it down between what we're making in the insurance business, what we're making in the ventures business, what we're making in the other businesses, what we make in the invest business, and uh, assign appropriate multiples for, to each of those, add it all up, subtract out the, the debt, and boom shakalaka, there's, there's some estimates. <laughs> Yeah, Tom nailed it. Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, I can remember back when very few, and, and probably still today, very few analysts uh, follow or, or, or try to put a number on, on Berkshire. And it was because from their standpoint, it was too hard. You couldn't just take book value and put a multiple against it and voila, you're, you're done. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, very proudly have tried to emulate a lot of the things uh, that, that Berkshire has done. And as the businesses that can't be valued off of multiple of book, as they become a bigger and bigger piece of Markel, it requires kind of a sum of the parts analysis to really dig in and understand the value of Markel. And I know the people in this room are smart enough to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll have no issue putting, putting that math together. I think it's important enough that I'll, I'll add a few thoughts to that too. I think Tom and Richie really covered it, but um, it's also the case as we think about businesses moving forward, I, I think it's going to be quite common that you actually aspire to find businesses with intangibles. And so we, we do have this aspect of a, of a significant portion of our balance sheet is held at fair value. That's really that historic insurance side. But these other businesses, these non-insurance businesses, they're not held at fair value. And, and all of a sudden, that is going to generate this decoupling to book value. And oddly enough, right, we record a lot of uh, intangible assets, and we amortize those off, and we never get to write up the value of these beautiful businesses that we own. They're generating the cash flow that Tom references. So, you know, hang in there, and we're going to continue to tell that story, and you'll see that in the financials. And I think this room is, is as Richie alluded to, you know, intelligent enough to follow that story. It's, it's baked in, embedded, I think, in the stock price. Um, but I just think from an acquisition standpoint, you'll continue to see us aspire to look at businesses where the intangibles are really what drives the value proposition of those businesses.